of a confession to make. I'm not a godless communist. Gasp. I'm a heathen communist. But what does it mean to be a heathen? Heathenry, in broad terms, is used to refer to most people of non-Christian or non-Abrahamic religious faiths, typically aimed at atheists, pagans, and Satanists, which themselves are different but can often be intertwined. However, heathenry itself is based in Germanic, Dane, and Norse culture, and is based on historical, archaeological, and folkloric evidence, though its interpretations varies depending on who you ask. Just like with the Ten Commandments, there are the nine noble virtues that some people practice and others do not. There are courage, honesty, honor slash integrity, fidelity, either to your partner, your family, or your friends, discipline, i.e. good moral fiber, or as I like to call it, just don't be an asshole, hospitality, self-reliance, perseverance, and good work ethic. Now, most of these some would argue, are just a matter of common sense and courtesy. And in some cases, yes, that could be considered the case. While some don't necessarily believe or practice these, not these nine noble virtues, it does not mean that they are used uh, or serve a noble, moral, moral, and ethical purpose. I myself don't necessarily follow these rules, but I believe that they are helpful and I try to abide by them as often and closely as I can, not because of any religious obligation, but more of a humanitarian reason. I feel the closer one is to some of these makes you a better human being. Some would call this righteousness or saintly, but as a pagan, I don't particularly like those terms. Courage is one I find myself struggling with essentially when it comes to, especially when it comes to talking to others or confrontation. But in a way, I practice my courageousness by standing up for myself and others when the cause is just. Honestly, their honesty, honor, and integrity, and fidelity is something I strive for every day. Because when you lie, especially to get out of trouble or don't own up to your mistakes, you have no integrity and thus no honor. I try to be an honest person through openness and transparency transparency, whether that's with my partner, my friends, my family, my co-workers, and my comrades. I own up to my mistakes, and I don't try to hide them. I thus have honor and integrity. I'm loyal to those around me, though some people may disagree based on growing divides, either on idealism, religious views, or politics, or just growing apart as people. But I'm never disloyal to people. If I have to part ways or distance myself for periods of time, I own up to my mistakes and theirs, and I let them know straight up that, hey, it's just not working out. Almost like a breakup between two romantic partners. I have friends that I don't talk to for months or years at a time, but we talk on the phone or video chat as like it was old times. One buddy of mine said at my wedding that I'm the person that would give the shirt off off their back for someone for somebody else, and I would typically tend to agree with that. That friendship has lasted long before my marriage and long after. I have friends who lean conservative politically, but we share common interests in guns and hate the ruling class, obviously for different reasons. They are the people I can share a beer with, despite our great deal of difference. Another friend of mine is a trans man, and we have been friends for nearly a decade. We transition together, and we share a lot in common. That dude is more than just a friend. He is the closest thing I probably have to a brother. He's family, and family is important and means everything to me. Now, for some people, especially those in the gay and trans community, that can be a touchy subject, sadly. And for obvious reasons. I am privileged that I have a family who is so accepting, even my conservative Lutheran great-grandmother. I call my family almost every day. We don't always agree on things, but my devotion and loyalty to them is nearly unshakable. I will defend them. I will fight for them. I will die for them. I'm also very protective of them. Many of you who have watched my video about my mom's wrongful termination for her humanity would know that. 
My fidelity to family isn't just out of respect, but because all that's left in the family is the women. All the men are either dead or non-existent. And I think because of that, it's almost the tribe of warrior women, in a sense. We protect each other. We protect our own. We give each other encouragement and empowerment because we are marginalized by the patriarchy and society for being strong and independent women. My great-grandmother got out and trimmed her yard until she was 95 years old. She reshingled her own roof at 88. She was climbing on ladders to put her Christmas decor up every year. She stayed calm and collected even when her husband got lost behind enemy lines while fighting the Nazis in World War II. Killing Nazis. This is a woman who has been the family matriarch since 1994, outlived the Queen of England, and potentially even Charlie Crown with the way things are going. Why won't you die? She uses a walker now, but she still gets up and early and makes coffee, has a beer or margarita with us every once in a while, and bakes cookies. <laughs> Cookies. That's perseverance. That's a strong woman. And frankly, they don't make them like that anymore. And when she passes, eh, it'll be like an era of history that has passed. My grandma is 77, and she mows the yard now. She takes care of her mom. She helps raise my 10-year-old sister. My mom, like me, survived domestic abuse from not only my father, but my sister's father as well. She survived 30 years of drug abuse and is diabetic. Despite this and being blackballed from by her former employer and the county she lives in, she drives for DoorDash and she raises a 10-year-old daughter as a single mom. And then there's my 10-year-old sister herself, who is just as sarcastic and demented as any of us in the family and has a bit of a potty mouth and sometimes gets her ass in trouble. But both her and I were raised collectively. My mom wasn't always around when I was a kid because of her addiction, and I was raised by my grandparents, but my mom always remained in contact with me. My sister was and is raised by our mom, our grandmother, my great-grandmother, sometimes friends, and when I was living with them, myself, and even my bitch of an ex-wife. Uh, we believe that it takes a village to raise a child, and sometimes that village needs a rogue sheriff, and that sheriff is my mom. And I'm like the shifty bartender at the saloon who either can turn in the outlaw or hide them behind the bar. The outlaw being, of course, my sister. Oh, what's that? It's mom's last nerve? Eh, I'm gonna touch it. Ma! 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 What? Hi. <laughs> I was raised by a family that believed in showing kindness, humanity, and good hospitality towards others. If a friend needs a place to crash because they had a bad blow-up with their partner, or was homeless and had nowhere else to go, my door is open. Need a friend or to vent to or shoulder to cry on? I'll take time off of work for you. You need me to help you hide a body? I got you, fam. Homicide. My friends got introduced to my family, and our policy was... There's the fridge, help yourself, here's the remote, take yourself, make yourself at home, and bathroom's down the hall to the at last door to your right. I take that same hospitality for my friends and family that enter my home. I'll even order DoorDash or get you home in an Uber if you need it. I'll drive across town to take your drunk ass home from a bar on St. Patty's Day or New Year's because I don't want, want you driving and I want you to get home safe. I try to maintain a good work ethic, even when I'm struggling with my own mental health or just not feeling the greatest. I don't particularly care for my job, but I'm not going to quit until I've found something better. And when I do work, I do what is required of me, and I'll go out of my way to help others, because my compassion and understanding is both my strength and a weakness. I maintain a strong discipline of don't be an asshole. I, you know, I don't take pride in being an asshole, but I will if I have to, especially when it comes to upholding another virtue. And while I live under capitalism and pay bills, being able to live on my own and keep food on the table and lights on in its own way is a form of self-reliance. 
In the face of adversity, in the face of my own mistakes and demons, I continue to persevere even when that mountain to climb is a bit rough, rugged, and taller than Olympus Mons. There are some that take these interpretations and skew them for their own idealism and zealotry. These people are often bigoted, racist, misogynistic individuals whose ideology is based around ethnic nationalism, such as the Nazis. These people use esoteric vision, versions of history and culture and romanticize them and glorify them as a symbol of racial and or national pride and heritage. That is not what heathenry is meant to represent and has never been what it is about. While it has to some degree been about the clan and kin aspect, this is largely referring to the noble virtues of honor and fidelity to one's village, not the nation or polity power, because there was not a concept of ethnicity or a nation state during those times. In fact, there is evidence to suggest a great deal of acceptance of other cultures and even religious uh, religions as artifacts coming from as far as India, the Far East, and the Islamic world have found their way to Germany, Denmark, and Scandinavia. Misogyny existed, sure, in some degrees, but unlike many Western civilizations that came before and after that, male heathens embraced, valued, and respected their female counterparts in battle and in the home. Women fought and died as equals on the battlefield of victory and defeat a feat that would not be replicated in that regard until the communist revolutions of the 20th century. Heathenry, nay, many pagan religions, are not based in hate. In fact, many had a great sense of animism, animalism, humanism, and camaraderie. The Celts, for example, to some degree, also upheld similar values to that of the Germanic tribes, the Danes, and the Norsemen. They held their, uh, their women in high regard, often fighting alongside men, or, in the case of the Iceni queen Boudicca, even led armies in revolts against imperialist conquerors. The, idea, the main idea to understand about paganism is that we don't covet the idea of nationalism or the nation-state. We value community, we value family and camaraderie. We also value nature and the elements more than anything else. If anything, we're more closer, closer to eco-socialists and communists. Those that skew that belief system for their own gain, i.e. fascists, often do so without understanding or respect for what our practices or customs are. This, to some degree, is due to Christian saboteurism and negative tropes pushed into, our, into or onto our religion. The same trope of devil worshippers or black magic is used when pushing these evil and totalitarian ideologies. In fact, these individuals are not heathen or pagan at all. If anything, it is a syncretic false religious faith centered around a nation and leader as its prophet, which itself is ardently pagan phobic. These individuals covet our religious practices, yet do not engage in the same customs or observances of Sabbaths i.e. Beltane, Yule, Samhain, nor do any of them share the same ancestry as many of, of those who practice these. And while I'm not going to specifically say that you can't be of Scandinavian or Germanic heritage to follow Norse paganism and its branches, or be Scottish or Irish to follow the Celtic pantheon, those who use it for bigotry and zealotry, whether they are of that heritage or not, are hypocrites who are culturally and religiously appropriating that heritage. As someone who is a Norse pagan myself and practices the faith with seriousness and scholarly respect, who is descended from the great Viking warrior Rollo and the, fa with, and the family of the legendary Ragnar Lothbrok, I find this to be grossly offensive to my religion, to my culture, and to my heritage. It is no different than somebody using the imagery of or culture of Native Amer Americans, or in the case of Hitler and the Nazis, the use, to, use of the swastika, an ancient divine Hindu and Buddhist symbol, as a symbol of hate, one that now has a stigma and negative connotation because of its association by evil people. In the same regard, 
the use of the, of the mule near for his hammer, or the volk nut, a symbol associated with Odin that is meant to honor those who had fallen in battle and gone to Valhalla by the far right, is a bastardization of its meaning and the cultural and religious significance to those who are of that ancestry. It is insulting, it is offensive. And it's a grave slap in the face to those that actually practice heathenry and paganism as a whole. Now, I've spent a lot of time on heathenry and the Norse pantheon, but that is just one subsection of paganism. For instance, there are some who believe in chemitism, uh, 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 which is the, I believe is how you pronounce it, Kemitism, uh, or the belief in the Egyptian, old Egyptian gods. I actually had an, an ex who was a Kemetic pagan. But I would argue her belief in the Egyptian paganism uh, uh, pantheon is solely based on her fixation or obsession of the culture itself and less to do with the respect to its beliefs. This is largely based on the fact that she is bisexual and autistic, yet shits on trans people. This not only is hypocritical in the feminist sense, which of course she, cl uh, she claims to be, but also in the paganistic sense, as one who would follow pagan belief systems would understand and know that hatred and zealotry of any kind is dogma and is the gravest of offensive offenses to our core values. We are not tied to omnipotent forces, but rather acknowledge strength and weaknesses being guided by the notion that guilt is more destructive to the spirit rather than the concept of sin, as practiced by Abrahamic faiths. Some faiths, like Norse mythology, believe in the concept of an Armageddon, or a rapture, but not in the same sense of a prophecy or impending doom for non-believers who will spend eternal damnation on earth or hell, but rather a warning that mankind may face a cataclysmic event if they continue to act unwisely towards themselves and the natural world, destroying humankind and or the planet in the process. This can be interpreted by modern pagans as the, you know, along with the growing sense of climate change and the threat of nuclear war. In Norse mythology, we refer to this Armageddon as Ragnarok. Now, paganism itself is a broad term that defines multiple belief systems, pantheons, cultures, etc. For instance, there are people that practice indigenous beliefs, whether that be Native American First Nations, which itself has various belief systems based around cultural and tribal traditions, whether it's Korean shamanism, whether it's folk religion of various nations around the world, whether it's Mayan, Aztec, Incan, etc. These may range to gods of rain, sun, fertility, you get the picture. In that same regard, there are people who practice Greco-Roman religious beliefs. The same concept applies, though. Uh, one deity may be the god or goddess of multiple, uh, with multiple attributes. For instance, Jupiter and Thor are often, or sorry, Jupiter and Odin are often seen as the sky gods, while Mars is seen as the god of war which is, itself is often shared by the Norse god and goddess Freyr and Freya, depending on who you ask. Venus Aphrodite, and Aphrodite, and even again Freya, are seen as the goddesses of love, sex, and fertility. Ah, Freya, you blessed little minx, you. And indeed, there are some deities that you can that can be given attributes that best fit them based around their mythology. For instance, Freya is my warrior goddess, a symbol of female empowerment. Paganism is fluid and leaves much room for interpretation so long as it's not disrespected or bastardized for personal idealism or fal false idolatry. For instance, Jupiter and Juno Ju for instance, Jupiter and Juno are often seen as the supreme god and goddess of the Roman pantheon, but one may choose to worship Mars and Venus instead. This is acceptable, as there are polytheistic and monotheistic pagans. I myself worship Odin as my Alfatha, but Freya as my supreme goddess. There are some that worship only one god, such as Odin or Mars. 
Wicca, a modern belief which uh, largely condemns, uh, which largely concerns light magic, is a witchcraft religion uh, that's, that states but not necessarily emphasizes the goddess or triple goddess, though some may choose to adhere to that as well as Wicca. Some may choose to worship a specific pantheon in addition to Wicca, or an eclectic hodgepodge of deities from various pantheons. I myself used to be Wiccan, though I don't really use that term to describe myself anymore. I am thankful and grateful that I have found Wicca, and it did help guide my principles and discipline as I found the right path for me. But I just don't subscribe to that belief system any longer. I still hold true some uh, some of the belief systems to Wicca itself, though, um, though it is not necessarily pagan, as it can be practiced in addition to other relig religions such as Christianity and Judaism. In fact, Kabbalah, a Jewish mysticist school of thought, while it is in itself not a pagan practice, can and does use elements of the metaphysical. Practical Kabbalah, another form of the practice, takes the concepts of contemporary Kabbalah and uses elements of white magic and, in fact, has much in common with Wicca. A friend of mine and of this network, Comrade Net, could probably tell you more than I can in this video, so please go over to his channel to learn more. I would also reference Dr. Mark A. Foster, Ph.D., from the Institute of Dialectical Metarealism, as he is also pretty knowledge knowledgeable on many of these subjects. Wicca, while itself a is a religious uh, is a religious form of witchcraft or a witchcraft religion, and itself focuses on the elements of myst mystical, metaphysical, and even animistic and animalistic forms. It is not the witchcraft religion, as many other forms of witchcraft religions do exist. There are Satanists, though some are just atheists out here playing off Christian satanic panic for the lulls, and Levian witches, neither of whom, con contrary to belief, do uh, neither of whom, contrary to, to belief, actually worship Satan, or the concept of Satan at least. From, a, from the modern Christian perspective. In fact, they have many moral and ethical virtues such as respect for women, respect for consent, and many other things that others take for granted or just simply do not emphasize. These practitioners practice magic that Wiccans deem too harmful, what I often refer to as defense against the dark arts, as it isn't so much that they practice with dark magic itself or hex people, as much as it is they practice defense against it and how to control it. Witchcraft has and is used as a means of providing holistic healing and medicine, treating infertility as a form of mental health therapy, and more. This can be seen in the Sabers of Norse paganism, the Druids of Gaelic, Celtic, and Brythonic cultures, and is even still practiced today amongst the cunning folk practitioners in various forms of shamanism and folk religions in indigenous circles all around the world. While these may not be practical in the terms of modern medicine and therapy, they're not all quackery. Some herbal and holistic remedies serve purposes of relieving common ailments such as headaches, joint pain, etc. Some have even been proven to help in the treatment of certain cancers, one of the most common of these being the cannabis plant. Ayahuasca, peyote, psilocybin are also common plant-based herbs that have been used to induce visions for spiritual reasons and religious rites, all the way to psychotherapy. They have also been known to help treat people with common forms of addiction, such as alcoholism and substance abuse. While historically and contemporarily seen by Christians and those who lack a basic understanding of witchcraft, some may be led to believe that witchcraft is some false religion who worships evil forces and demonic spirits and that are drug addicts. But that could be farther from the truth. Before the usage of modern drugs to treat many medical and mental conditions, these were the resources we had at our disposal, aside from bleeding of the patient with leeches or praying for their salvation in health, often with poor results. 
Witchcraft deals with more of the natural world, the elements, the universe, and stars, more than it does on physical magic. Sorcery, to a lesser extent, is more of a practitioner dealing in the realm of alchemy and crystal work, and the manipulation of the metaphysical rather than black magic that the general public has tended to believe is true. Sor sorcery is more of a defense against the dark arts than it is used in malice. Not to say that some people can't use magic in a malicious manner, but if our friends who believe in karma are to be believed, then every action has an equal and opposite reaction. What goes around comes around. Fuck around and find out. You get the point. Essentially, if one of, was to use magic to curse or hex another person, you not only bring upon bad energy upon the target, but you also in turn accept twofold the ramifications that follow. This is often why most practitioners of witchcraft strongly advise against this, as the craft is based in defending ourselves against malevolent forces rather than inviting them in upon ourselves or upon others. Again, harm none, do as he wills. Witchcraft can also deal in the art of what we would consider a form of chemistry, and that is the art of potion making, as some would probably tie it to, or other, also known sometimes as the witch's brew. This can be anything from a mere hobby and interest in chemistry, or one's own religious observance, or something as simple as making a broth or tea for herbal or holistic reasons, which themselves can be used for recreational or medicinal purposes. The most common forms of witchcraft by practitioners is that which has been co-opted by many so-called psychics, mystics, and fortune tellers, etc., who often give people this false hope or bad advice by bastardizing our practice for monetary gain. But we as true practitioners know that the true art that it is, is divination, which goes just beyond the seances that you see in TV and film and all that sort of stuff. It goes beyond that, or even beyond reading of tarot, palm readings, etc. Divination often leans on the cosmos, astronomy, and to some degree, even astrology, but lesser of an extent on the latter. These practitioners are often synonymous with oracles and say that is of the old religions and are often misconstru uh, misconstrued as fortune tellers. When those of us that practice this particular form of witchcraft don't so much see or tell the future, rather we outline the options and the consequences that could potentially face ourselves or the subject who comes to us for that guidance. In this case, we would like we would be more like an extra con an extra conscience, a guide, a counselor, so to speak, or even a therapist in some contexts. We provide a sense of mental service in a way, a person who can ease one's burdens over their fears and anxieties, insecurities, concerns, their questions of the unknown, etc. We lay out the paths that lay ahead for the significator or the subject who is the focal point of the situ common situation, but we ultimately leave it to that person and their interpretation and leave it in their hands, essentially giving the ball, you know, put the ball in their court to decide the path that they choose. And the way that a therapist is there to kind of help guide the person in untangling their mess of mental wires rather than telling them what to do. There is not really a right and wrong way to be a witch or a pagan, or even a heathen. It is more of what you make of it and how you interpret things. However, the wrong way to be to be a pagan, to be a witch, to be a heathen, is jumping into something or dabbling in the ways that you are unprepared for or inexperienced for. It is appropriating culture and religious significance, the traditions and customs for your own personal or political gain that is offensive to not only other practitioners, but also to the gods. It is why it is important to stick to some form of conduct for yourself and to research, educate yourself, and practice these rules and religious customs as you grow. If you can, 
take on a mentor who has been in this practice for some time to help guide you in your training. But ultimately, as the age-old saying goes, practice makes perfect, and Rome wasn't built in a day. I'm Red Pig and Nicole, and thank you for watching. Blessed be the merry part.